السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Welcome again to another episode of our weekly lectures another session Inshallah ta'ala tonight we're going to discuss a hadith we're going to look at uh, one of the female companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, not many people know about her ex- actually because we don't have a lot of information other than this famous story of hers. And her name is Um Zafar. Uh, um Zafar. So this is a hadith that's uh, collected in both Bukhari and Muslim. And it's from Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. Um, Ata ibn Abi Rabah, who was from the Tabi'un, Tabi'un or the people of the second generation, the people who were Muslims, believers, sat with, walked with, saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They were of course known as the Sahaba of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the companions. The Tabi'un are the people of the second generation, the followers. And the Tabi' Tabi'in are the people from the third generation. And that, of course, these three generations combined, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told us in uh, a few ahadith that they are the best of the Muslims. The best of the ummah are the first three generations. So, of course, after the death of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the companions, the scholars of the companions, they were spread out in different cities, uh, different towns that were under Muslim rule that became Muslim. And this was from the wisdom of the companions that they branched out so they could teach and establish Islamic centers, places of learning. They would be teaching in the masajid so that the new Muslims would learn about the Qur'an properly and learn about the statements of the Prophet ﷺ, learn their religion from reciting Qur'an to meanings to fiqh issues, everything. So this was from the wisdom of the companions that they branched out and formed their own schools, if you would like to uh, say it in that context, that they, many of them, the scholars among the companions. And of course, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, he was one of the scholars, the Qur'an scholars uh, of, among the companions. So Ata ibn Abi Rabah was one of his students from the Tabi'un. So, and he narrated this hadith, or he starts off that, Qala li ibn Abbas, Ibn Abbas said to me, Ala urika imra'atan min ahlil jannah? Shall I show you a woman from the people of paradise? This was a question that Abdullah ibn Abbas asked Ata. Qultu bala. Ata replied, Yes, indeed, show me which woman is from the people of paradise. Qala hadihi al mar'atu sawda'u. So perhaps there was a situation that she showed up in front of them or there was a situation where Ata also knew about her and it just uh, crossed the mind of Abdullah ibn Abbas to uh, explain this or explain to his students who exactly she was. So Abdullah ibn Abbas said, this black woman she is, she came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, فقالت, and she said, Inni usra, I am someone who suffers from epilepsy. I get epileptical seizures. Wa inni atakashafu, and my body becomes uncovered. فَدِعُ اللَّهَ لِي So make dua to Allah for me. She came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, told him that he, she suffers from epilepsy. She becomes uncovered when she's having her seizures. Her asking the Prophet wasallam meant that فَدِعُ اللَّهَ لِي Make dua to Allah for me. It means, ask Allah to cure me of this situation. Right? قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ إِن شِئْتِ صَبَرْتِ وَلَكِ الْجَنَّةِ If you wish, be patient, and you will have Jannah. So she came and asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, فَدِعُوا اللَّهَ لِي Make dua to Allah for me. The Prophet replied to her, إِن شِئْتِ صَبَرْتِ وَلَكِ الْجَنَّةِ If you are patient, 
If you wish, be patient and you will have paradise. وَإِن شِئْتِ دَعَوْتُ اللَّهَ أَنْ يُعَافِيَكِ And if you wish, I can make dua to Allah to cure you of your illness. فَقَالَتْ So upon hearing this, she told the Prophet wasallam. she replied, أَصْبِرُوا I'll remain patient. فَقَالَتْ And she added to the Prophet wasallam. إِنِّي أَتَكَشَّفُ Indeed, I become undressed, uncovered. فَدْعُوا اللَّهَ أَنْ لَا أَتَكَشَّفُ Make dua to Allah. So make dua to Allah that I don't become uncovered. I'll be patient, but just make dua to Allah so that I don't become uncovered. فَدَعَى لَهَا Then the Prophet wasallam made dua for her, for that. In this hadith, as we said, the text that I uh, mentioned right now, this is found in both Bukhari and Muslim. It's agreed upon. But this hadith has been recorded in other collections as well, and not just in Bukhari and Muslim. It's also, you'll find some versions of it in an nasai and a tirmidhi And when you took, uh, take all those narrations combined, we also have some of the narrations that mention her name as Um Zafar. This particular version from Abdullah ibn Abbas did not mention her name. It just said, Abdullah ibn Abbas just said that هذه المرأة السوداء, this black woman. Uh, but the other narrations or the other versions of this mention her name as Um Zafar. Now let's dissect this hadith and understand the qualities of Umm Zafar and the, some of the rulings that are contained in this hadith. First of all, Abdullah ibn Abbas, he asked Ata' Ala urika imra'atan min ahlil jannah Shall I show you a woman from the people of paradise? Whenever it comes to ahlul jannah, this concept of the people of paradise, our aqidah, the aqidah of ahlul sunnah wal jama'ah, the aqidah that the Prophet ﷺ came with. People of Jannah, Ahlul Jannah are of two types, two categories, or people are divided into two categories when it comes to Ahlul Jannah. There are some who are of Ahlul Jannah because at face value they have the attributes of, of the attributes of the people of Jannah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned to us in the Qur'an in multiple places. There's numerous ahadith uh, that such and such action, such and such people end up in paradise. So that's the first category. Like for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Ali Imran, وَسَارِعُوا إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّن رَبِّكُمْ And rush, rush to the forgiveness of your Lord. وَجَنَّةٍ أَرْضُهَا السَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضُ a paradise, rush to, rush to the forgiveness of your Lord and the paradise, the paradise which is as wide as the heavens and the earth, and it is u'iddat lil muttaqin. It is promised for the people who have taqwa, muttaqun. So from this verse, and there are many other verses similar to this, we understand a general ruling. In order to be from Jannah, you must be from the muttaqun. You must be from the salihun. You must be from the muhsinun. So on and so forth. So Ahlul Jannah. If we see someone, Alhamdulillah, man or woman, doesn't matter. A believing man, believing woman, that mashallah, tabarakallah, this person is a righteous Muslim. He or she has her salawat intact. Uh, they, they are very good in their speech. They are good in their characteristics. They are honest. They're loyal to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're loyal to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So they have the attributes of the people of Jannah. They're from the muttaqun or the salihun or the muhsinun. So we say, insha'Allah, fulan or fulana, so-and-so will be from, uh, from Jannah. We hope, right? This is one category that we can't say to somebody, regardless of how righteous you may think that that person was, someone dies, a very pious person, man or woman, you knew that person to be very righteous, a good Muslim. That's great. 
you make dua to Allah for Allah to have mercy on this person, for Allah to admit this person to Jannah. But we cannot say that let's say somebody died yesterday and today I'm like, I guarantee brothers and sisters, Fulan is in Jannah. We can't say that. In order to make such a claim, we need evidence from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which brings us to the second category of Ahlul Jannah. But also, before moving on, another verse, Let's look, because we want to understand this aspect very clearly. Sometimes people, they exaggerate in praising people. Somebody is a suicide bomber. He blows himself up, blows something else. Oh, so-and-so was a mujahid, that 15-year-old kid that blew himself up. He was a mujahid, he's a shaheed, he's this, he's that. This is how the Muslim ummah talks today. What does Allah say about suicide? What does Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say about suicide? For example, one, uh, one hadith, a hadith Qudsi found in Bukhari, that Allah, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, that Allah said, Badarani abdi haramtu alayhi al-jannah. My slave brought himself to me before his appointed time. I have made paradise haram for him. That's what Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said about the one who commits suicide. But then we have people today, emotional Muslims, somebody blows himself up, which is suicide, and not only that, he kills other innocent people with him, non-combatants, women and children. He does a, 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 you know, atrocious acts, but emotional Muslims will be like, oh, he's a shaheed. You cannot talk this way. If someone is a good Muslim, dies, we say, inshallah, he is from Jannah. We hope he is from Jannah. We make dua to Allah that Allah gives him mercy, or her mercy and admits them to paradise. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ أُولَٰئِكَ هُمْ خَيْرُ الْبَرِيَّةِ Those who do righteous deeds, those who have iman, those who believe and perform righteous deeds, they are خَيْرُ الْبَرِيَّةِ They are the best of creation. So Allah has spoken generally. Anyone who has good iman, anyone who performs righteous deeds, they are the best of Allah's creation. جَزَاؤُهُمْ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ جَنَّاتُ عَدْنٍ تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارُ خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا أَبَدًا The reward for such people that from their Lord that they will be granted into paradise, gardens under which rivers flow, and they will live in those gardens forever. رضي الله عنهم وردوا عنه Allah is pleased with them and uh, uh, they are pleased with Him. ذَلِكَ لِمَنْ خَشِيَ رَبَّهُ this is the reward for those who have fear, those who fear their Lord. So it's general. There are many other verses in the Qur'an that give out this general message. That the salihun, the mu'minun, they will insha'Allah be from paradise. So when someone dies, we say that. So that's the first category of Ahlul Jannah, general terms. The second category are those who are specifically, we have evidence from Allah, meaning in the Qur'an, or we have evidence from the words of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that such and such people, or such and such person, fulan or fulana, he or she is from Jannah, or she is in Jannah. We need dalil for that, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa have mentioned that. So we see this hadith, this specific hadith of Umm Zafar, what did Abdullah ibn Abbas say to Ata'ah? أَلَا أُرِيكَ إِمْرَأَةً مِنْ أَهْلِ الْجَنَّةِ Shall I show you a woman from Jannah? So this is very specific. That this woman is from Jannah. She's already, she's already been given the, good, uh, the glad, good news, the glad tidings from the Prophet ﷺ that she is somebody from Jannah. So this is different. This is the second category. This was specific. We have evidence from Rasulullah ﷺ that so-and-so, this woman, is a person of Jannah. Similarly, the Prophet ﷺ, in the famous hadith, like for example, the ten who were promised paradise. Abu Bakr is in Jannah. Uh, Umar is in Jannah. Uthman, uh, Uthman is in Jannah. Ali radiallahu anhu is in Jannah. Then, uh, Sa'id ibn Zayd, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas, Abdurrahman ibn Awf, uh, Talha ibn Ubaidullah, um, then uh, Abu Ubaidah Abu Ubaida ibn al-Jarrah 
and Az Zubair ibn Awam. Right? These are the ten companions who are promised paradise. So today, me and you, we can say, guaranteed Abu Bakr is in paradise. Guaranteed Umar is in paradise. Guaranteed Uthman is in paradise. And so on. Radiallahu anhum. Why can we say this? Mentioning them by name? Because we have evidence in our religion. The Prophet ﷺ himself mentioned these names. Or you have from other hadith, Thabit ibn Qais radiallahu anhu. Uh, Thabit ibn Qais ibn Shammas, that was his full name. Or the likes of Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. Or the likes of Bilal ibn Rabah, the first Mu'addin, right? And there are other companions. All of the Sahaba in general are in paradise. All of them. Each and every single one of them. From the old to the young to the male to the female. And some of them are ahead. They will be from the leaders of Ahlul Jannah. They will have the highest station in paradise alongside with the Anbiya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they have been mentioned by name. So we have to be very careful when today you, the, a person could be the most knowledgeable scholar. May Allah have mercy on him. May Allah preserve him. We make dua for such a person. We don't... Uh, you know, bring him down, we show him the respect that Islam mandates us to respect our teachers of the religion. We do all that, but none of us can guarantee that so-and-so is in paradise. We hope, we hope, we make dua to Allah that this person and us, we be from paradise. So be, be careful, do not exaggerate because then it becomes sinful. So the two categories of people of paradise, those who have been are general, anyone from the salihun, from the muttaqun, inshallah ta'ala, provided they die in that state, they will be in paradise, then the second category are the specific mentioned people right, so inshallah hopefully this difference is clear and you control guard your tongue uh, when you speak about people, whether they be relatives or friends or scholars whoever it may be the case we stay within the balanced approach that Islam mandates for us to follow. We don't exaggerate in the praising of anyone. So let's go back to the hadith. This was the first um, lesson from this hadith that it's important for us to understand. So we see Um Zafar, this uh, African woman, the woman of African descent. She was somebody, Abdullah ibn Abbas said, Atatin Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One day she came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this was a woman, also before we move on, she had absolutely no status in the community. No status. Just a black woman, random black woman, right? And you have to understand the context of the speech as well. When after the nubuwa of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Black people had rights. Before that, they didn't. Islam gave them rights. Islam gave rights to widows, women who lost their husbands, divorced women, children, uh, Africans. All those people that were seen in Roman society, Greek society, Arab society, these pagan societies that used to exist, these type of people are looked down upon. Widows would be shunned. Divorced women would be shunned, like as if they're nothing, they're uh, worthless goods, second-hand goods. This is how people would talk about women who are widows or divorced. And sadly, many Muslim cultures speak about such women right now again, just like the people in Jahiliyyah, as if they've never heard about Islam, right? So black people, before the nubuwa of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa they also didn't have much status. You look at Bilal radiallahu anhu, another black person. He was a slave. So this is what the nature of the human beings, the people across the world were. This, is their, this was their attitude towards African people. Of course, we find ourselves in the, living in the same situation now with all the racism that's out there, subhanAllah. That's why we say the solution to world problems is Islam. If people actually understood Islam and followed Islam, all of their social ills will disappear overnight. Right? So... This woman, she had no status in the community. She suffered from epilepsy. So this is why many of the ahadith or majority of the ahadith, they just say, Mar'atu sawda, a black woman, 
who had epilepsy. That's why you have to look at all the narrations mentioning this incident. Then we get the name Umm Zafar because one of the narrations mentioned her name or a couple of the narrations. So she suffered from uh, epilepsy. She came that atat an Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam faqalat she said inni usra that I suffer from indeed I suffer from epilepsy. I suffer seizures and so on and so forth. This is what happens to uh, people with this illness. And she came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam knowing that this is all of the prophets and messengers as we have discussed many times before they were uh, barakah from Allah. The prophets and messengers, while they were alive, they were barakah for their people. So you would find there's many other ahadith in Bukhari and other books. Like for example, even if the Prophet ﷺ would spit, the Sahaba would collect the spit and rub it on them because his spit would have barakah. You look at our mother Aisha radiallahu anha. This is the wife, right? His wife. The miswak, the toothbrush, right? That the Prophet ﷺ would use. She would quickly grab onto it and then brush her own teeth with it. It doesn't mean... As a wife today, you go use the same toothbrush as your husband. Do not do this. This is very, very unhealthy. <laughs> you don't have to love your husband that much, right? Don't do that. That's very unhealthy. But our mother, Aisha, she did this because her husband wasn't an ordinary man. This was Rasulullah. So I want the barakah of his saliva. This is how the Anbiya, the Prophets and the Messengers wore. So any dua that he would make, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, for sure Allah will accept it. So what they used to do, anytime somebody was sick, there's another famous hadith about a blind man coming to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but that deals with a whole different aqidah issue altogether uh, about, uh, you know, tawassul. So we wanna, we, we'll talk about it later, but I'm just mentioning that there's other situations. Different types of companions suffering from different illnesses, they would come rather than making dua by themselves. Of course, they would depend on Allah. They're making dua themselves. But they would also come to the Prophet ﷺ, not make dua to the Prophet. This is not what she did. She came to the Prophet and said, فَدِعُوا اللَّهَ لِي Ask Allah for me. Make dua to Allah for me. And subhanAllah, we have people today claiming to be Muslims. And they're saying, Ya Rasulullah, give me this, give me this. They're going into this level of shirk. None of the companions ever came to the Prophet ﷺ, even while he was alive. Oh Allah's Prophet, give me such and such. No, they would say, you ask Allah on my behalf. Can you make the dua for me? Because he was a man of barakah. This is the Rasul of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah would listen to him, his request. So this is another example. So this woman, Umm Zafar, she came to uh, to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi and said, "Make du'a to Allah because I am inni usra. I suffer from epilepsy." So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, she he replied to her, "Qala in shi'ti sabarti walakil jannah." So he heard the request, and this is the way that the leaders are. Everybody that had problems, social problems, physical problems, emotional problems, they would come to the Muslim leader, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and they would discuss, they would seek counsel, they would seek solutions to their issues, seek advice, so on and so forth. You come to the religious source about your life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't just give this life for us for play and this and that. It's like, okay, there's... Because many people, they think this. What's Islam? Just salah and siyam and that's it. I'm suffering a problem in my health, in my life, in my home. Ah, it's okay. It's, this is just religion. It's about prayer and fasting and this and that. Do you think Allah is like that? That Allah, Rabbul Alameen, in His final revelation, in his, through His final prophet and messenger, He's not going to explain to you about the life issues? I mean, how can you think about this? Think like this about Allah. This is why we find many Muslims, they're suffering in their marriage, they're suffering in their homes, they're suffering in their businesses, they're suffering in their communities, because they think, I know better. Ah, religion, what's religion? Brother, why don't you read the Qur'an? 
your problem is mentioned there. Why don't you read some ahadith? Your, the solution to your problems is mentioned there. No, no, it's about prayer, it's about this. It's just rituals. Because the Muslims, they took this attitude from the non-Muslims. Right? You look at an average Christian, even a practicing Christian, practicing Jew, practicing Hindu, practicing this, that. They don't go to their religious texts for solutions to every problem in life because they know it doesn't exist. But Islam is different. This is the religion from Allah. Subhanallah, it is so much so, the Jews of Medina would mock. Oh, what type of prophet is this? He teaches his followers how to use the bathroom. And then what did the companions reply to these Jews? That we are blessed that Allah has sent this final prophet and messenger, this final revelation to cover every aspect of our lives, including how to use the bathroom, has been mentioned by Allah and His Prophet ﷺ. Everything has been mentioned, every aspect of your life. So it's the Muslims who fail to go research, go back to the Qur'an, go back to the Sunnah, and try to find the solutions, solutions to their problems. That's our issue. Right? We make a bigger problem out of the existing problem by ignoring what Allah and His Messenger have stated. So this woman, because she was a believer, she was one of the Sahabiyat, the female companions, she knows where the source of all cure is. So she went and asked the Prophet ﷺ. You would think, you got epilepsy, why don't you go to a doctor? Why are you going to Allah's Messenger? This is how modern day Muslims will think. Right? This is how they think. Ah, this woman suffers from epilepsy. Why didn't, she, why didn't she go to a doctor? Why was she going to Allah's Prophet? And we shall see why she went there. So the Prophet replied to her in Shi'ti Sabarti Walakil Jannah. If you are patient, if you are patient, then you will have Jannah. So this woman, this is how the Sahaba they used to be. The Prophet ﷺ just verbalized an opportunity to attain paradise. They would quickly grab onto that opportunity. They wouldn't wait for tomorrow. Here is something that the Prophet ﷺ just mentioned. That if I do kada wa kada, such and such, I will be from Jannah. No problem, go ahead right away. This was the companions of Rasulullah, men and women. Even the women that we had, they're insignificant people in community. She didn't do anything. This is the only thing that she's known for. This incident, that's it. It's not that she was like Aisha or Khadija or Fatima or of, of the other Ummahatul Mu'mineen or Asma bint Abi Bakr or Ummu Haram, like famous, famous uh, women companions who did, they were, they were giants of Islam. They did such tremendous actions, right? Their biographies are huge. But this woman was insignificant. But she was a companion nonetheless. And she had the attributes of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. That Rasulullah ﷺ just told me to do one thing and I can be from Jannah. For sure I'm going to do it. So she's suffering from epilepsy. And she's telling the Prophet ﷺ that not only... Inni usra, I suffer from epilepsy. Wa inni atakashafu. That and then when I'm having the epileptical episodes, my garment, uh, you know, she's shaking. She's having the she seizures, so she becomes undressed. She becomes exposed. In that type of situation, Rasulullah tells her, "If you are patient, you will have paradise." Can you imagine? Let's say you have some illness like this woman, or even one of the brothers. And of course, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all from illnesses. We go to somebody. We talk it out with a sheikh. We talk it out with an alim. We talk it out with an imam. What would your reaction be if the sheikh tells you, brother, sister, I know you're suffering from this issue. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help you. If you are patient, you will receive paradise. What would your reaction be? What a nonsense, foolish sheikh. What type of advice is this? Does he not know what I'm suffering for so many years? This is how the modern day Muslim reacts. 
That's why you and I are not the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. This is why we came thousands of years, a thousand years after them. Over a thousand years after them. If we had that type of thinking, that type of heart, Allah would have made us born in that generation. But we're not like that. The average Muslim today, they're not like this. If somebody's suffering some health issue, we tell them, sister, brother, go pray Qiyamul Layl, ask Allah more. Are you crazy? You don't know what you're talking about. This is how they react. Subhanallah. Allah is the giver of cure. Allah is the giver of sickness. Why don't you cry to Him? Be patient. Right? So this woman, she knew this. She's having major episodes. She has severe seizures. She, become un she becomes undressed. But she immediately submits that she, the Prophet ﷺ said, if you have patience, you'll have Jannah. And if you want, وَإِن شِئْتِ دَعَوْتُ اللَّهَ أَنْ يُعَافِيَكِ If you wish, I can make dua to Allah to cure you. So the Prophet ﷺ gave her a choice because he understood that this poor woman, she is suffering tremendously. So from his rahmah, he gave her a choice. She chose, I'll be patient because you said that will lead me to Jannah. No need. Don't ask Allah to cure me. I'll be patient with this disease, with this illness. I'll live with it for as long as I live. Inshallah ta'ala be from Jannah. Look at this. This woman that nobody even cared about. She wasn't anybody important in the community. Yesterday she was looked down upon because she, she was black. And today, till the day of resurrection, everyone will narrate her story. Subhanallah. You see how Allah honors the people of Iman? This is how Allah honors them. That throughout the Muslim world, for, for, since that time, starting from Abdullah ibn Abbas himself, he was, who's the one teaching the story or narrating the story? Abdullah ibn Abbas telling his student Ata. From that time, inshallah, till the day of judgment, people will hear this woman's story. That's the honor that comes from Allah. That is the gift that comes if you are from the people of Jannah. If you are patient for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So she said, okay, I'll be patient. However, she added, inni atakashafu fad'ullaha an la atakashafu. I become undressed. At least make dua to Allah so I can remain covered. This is a believing woman. She's suffering seizures. She has no control of what is happening to her body. And I don't know how many of you have ever uh, witnessed someone having seizures in front of you. Uh, I'm not going to say alhamdulillah for it, but it is what it is. Uh, everything comes from Allah. We praise Him. It's not a very good sight. I mean, the people who are having seizures in front of you, uh, for different issues as we shall discuss right now in a few minutes this is not an easy thing to see like seriously if you have ever seen people having severe seizures in front of your eyes you will know what that person is suffering so even in that situation they have no control over what's happening in their body they're shaking they have absolutely zero control but this woman she is worried about her hijab that make sure that my, my, my aura does not get exposed. What about the healthy, talking, living Muslim women today? No health issue whatsoever. They run from the word hijab. And here is Um Zafar. She is physically ill. She is having seizures. But she is worried that her aura might get exposed. And someone who does not have the right to see her body may see her body. Even in that state, she's worried about her hijab, sisters. These are the women of Jannah. So if you are a healthy woman today, and you still don't worry about hijab, this is something you have to ask yourself. You have to look yourself in the mirror and be like, what's wrong with me? These are the ladies you should learn about. That even in that severe situation, she's asking the Prophet ﷺ, okay, don't ask Allah to cure me, I'll be patient. Because I want to go to Jannah. However, at least ask Allah that my clothing does not become uncovered. May my hijab stay on me. Because she could be, maybe she's going to 
the marketplace, all of a sudden she has an episode and she starts having seizure on the street and she gets exposed. Or maybe someone, maybe she's in front of her house, starts having seizures because people who suffer from these things, it's not that, oh, listen, at 10 a.m. tomorrow, I'm going to come strike you. So make sure in your, in, 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 you are in the privacy of your home. It can come all of a sudden, out of nowhere, right? So this is why she was worried. What if I have these seizures in public, in a marketplace, in front of my house, while I'm walking around, whatever may be the case? When that happens, ask Allah that my aura does not get exposed, my hijab doesn't come off, right? Subhanallah. So of course, these are the women of Jannah, that they cared about preserving their chastity. They cared about preserving, uh, looking like the believing women. They know the importance of hijab. It's a command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is why she's asking the Prophet sallallahu even in that state, right? Make sure, ask Allah not to expose me. So seriously, my dear sisters, take this into sincere consideration. That who, how, what kind of iman this woman had. That these are the women you should try your level best to imitate bi'idnillah. Now, before um, moving further, the other aspect or the main issue here in this hadith, if you want to put it that way, we see clearly here that she suffered, as she said, inni usra, meaning I suffer from epilepsy. In the sharia, this disease of epilepsy has two, inter not interpretations, uh, two causes. There's two reasons as to why a person will suffer from epilepsy. The first is an actual medical condition, the nerve spasms that happen. This is due to a physical illness. Maybe the person, while being born, something happened. The brain got a little bit injured, or somebody got hit on the head, major hit on the head. Something happened, right? A physical damage took, occurred, because of which the person, man or woman, now suffers epilepsy. This is one cause that Islam accepts, right? And for this, of course, uh, there, the person has to take some medication, has to go to the doctor, has to take medication to subdue the episodes. Or it may be completely remove it, numb that person to the point that maybe they won't have the seizures anymore, the episodes, right? There's medication available. So if someone today, Allah forbid, has an actual physical head damage or some type of nerve damage which causes these seizures, that's different. You go to the doctor and you take your medication accordingly. The second reason mentioned in the Sharia is that people suffer epilepsy due to the jinn, due to the shayateen either uh, because of mas, the possession, maybe a jinn possessed her because the jinn likes her, maybe the jinn possessed her because of some sihr, by, because of some spell that was put on her, whatever may be the case, but it's due to some jinn-related issue. This specific woman, radiallahu anha, she suffered the second type. She suffered the second type. It wasn't an actual medical condition. In the narration that is collected in Al-Bazzar, and also some other narrations in Bukhari itself, in the narration in, that's recorded in Al-Bazzar, it is very clear. She, the statement she used with the Prophet wasallam, she said, Inni akhaful khabitha an yujarridni. That's the narration that came from the companion. That indeed I fear... The Khabith, I fear the evil, wicked one who strips me. So meaning her epilepsy is because she gets possessed and then as she is having her episode, she becomes undressed. So her epilepsy was clearly from jinn-related issues. Also, Ibn Hajar, rahimahullah, who is the author of Fathul Bari, which is the explanation of Sahih al-Bukhari, he mentioned in the explanation of this hadith, that it, it is understood from the different narrations collectively that Umm Zafar was suffering from the kind of epilepsy that is caused by the shayateen. And she was not suffering epilepsy due to some dysfunction in the brain. So this is well known. 
the scholars of Ahlul Sunnah, they interpreted this hadith, taking all of the hadith into account. These are her own words. She's afraid of the khabith who strips her. So as she gets possessed, when she has the possessed episodes, then that's when she becomes undressed. But of course, this is epilepsy nonetheless. If you see uh, the actual seizures that are happening, whether someone is suffering from a medical condition or it is because of this jinn-related issues, there is absolutely no difference. No difference between the person who has a physical brain issue, the way they're moving about and having the episode, and the person who is possessed having the exact same episode, the untrained eye, the person who is not knowledgeable about the Qur'an and the Sunnah, about the Qur'an, about the issues of sihr and ayn and mas, they will not be able to tell. You could bring the biggest well-known neurologist and put him in front of somebody suffering from epilepsy due to jinn, there's no way he's going to know because they don't, obviously science does not explain these things, right? So jinn possessions, these type of epilepsies happen due to jinn possession. And this is the aqidah of Ahlul Sunnah. We affirm this that jinn can enter the body of human beings due to mas, which is just being touched. Mas means that so-and-so has been touched by the jinn. It was a possessed. Something happened. And there's different reasons. Like, for example, maybe you go out somewhere, and this especially for our young people, old people, anyone, doesn't matter. Maybe you really got to go to the bathroom, answer the call of nature. Okay, what can we do? There's no uh, portable... Uh, bathrooms here, we're in the park, we're camping, what am I going to do? Okay, let me just go behind a tree or a bush and just start urinating. You have to be careful when you go to these type of situations, you have to make your adhkar from the sunnah. Right, when you go out to these empty spaces, uh, that this is from the sunnah. The Prophet ﷺ said, whenever you go to these places, an empty, barren place, you're traveling through the highway. Even though you live in America, you might be driving, what's the highway next to us? The expressway or I-95, whatever may be the case. Maybe, I'm talking about the men, inshallah this type of issue does not happen to the women, then they're really asking for trouble, right? Maybe one of the brothers is driving and then seriously he has to go and there's nothing. The next exit is like 10 miles away. He can't wait. He's gonna park his car, Go walk, get out of the highway, go a little bit further into the bushes and hopefully you have water or other wipes with you inshallah. And then you are going to answer the call of nature. Before you do that, make your adhkar. Say the dua, you're in this open land. Say your, uh, say bismillah before you take off your uh, clothes, before you sit down. Say the dua of the bathroom even though you're not entering the bathroom. Make these adhkar to protect yourself because you have no idea who or what lives there, right? There have been reports, authentically reported. The scholars have mentioned somebody urinated into a hole and that hole turned out to be a house of a jinn. So that jinn, imagine if somebody came to your house, urinated all over the walls, you'd beat him to death. Same thing. You urinated into a hole, which you think is a hole, but that was a house of a jinn. This jinn retaliated by possessing the person. So these type of incidents have been recorded by the scholars of Ahlul Sunnah from the mightiest of them like Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Al-Qayyim, Imam Ahmed. If you read their books and their encounters, like really massive, they're, they're, this is a whole ocean of knowledge. Uh, if anyone learns about these things or helps or, or learns about the, uh, the process, the proper Quranic procedure of Ruqya, there is, I don't think you'll ever go or learn without reading something from Ibn Taymiyyah, right? MashaAllah, rahimahullah, he has written extensively on this topic. There was uh, one incident that Ibn Taymiyyah mentioned. Uh, uh, a person was possessed and they had came to Ibn Taymiyyah uh, to help with that person's uh, ruqya, right? So Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, visited that person. And uh, the person was suffering uh, from epilepsy, right? Was having these epileptical seizures. So, of course, Ibn Taymiyyah being the giant that he was, he explained to the people that this is not a medical condition. This is actually from jinn issues. So they were reciting, reciting the Qur'an, and then uh, Ibn Taymiyyah was telling this person, or, or the jinni inside the person, that Ittaqillah, fear Allah, exit, ukhruj, exit this person, leave, you don't belong in this body. Uh, and then it turned out that 
this specific story that I'm mentioning that Ibn Taymiyyah recorded in his books, it was a woman, a female jinn that had possessed the man because she fell in love with this man. So this female jinni was speaking and replied to Ibn Taymiyyah that no, I love him and I'm not going to leave him. And I want to make hajj inside him. While being inside him, I'll make hajj with him. I'm in so much love, I'm going to make hajj with him. <laughs> right? So, so Ibn Taymiyyah said, no, you have to leave him. If you want to make hajj, you go make your own hajj. You can't be making hajj while inside a body of a human being. Right? So he was explaining this and making this jinni fear Allah and repent and this and that. So then the jinni said, okay, by your izza, bi izzatik, I will, re- I will leave. Of course, Ibn Taymiyyah was a scholar of Tawheed. This is a statement of shirk. By your honor, I'm going to leave. So Ibn Taymiyyah caught this because he's an expert in the field of aqidah. He's like, no, you leave by the izza of Allah, not me. Many, many people, right? Because this is the shaitan. And uh, you know how these uh, really, in modern day times, you will find on YouTube, oh, this guy's doing ruqya and there's the video and this and that. Like people turned it into a movie, right? Because of all the Hollywood horror movies that people watch. It's like brothers are doing ruqya on people, men and women, and they're making a YouTube video as they're doing ruqya. This is not something from our religion. We don't, we're not supposed to make entertainment out of these medical issues. This is actual, these are issues, these are illnesses. It's from shaitan, but it's an illness. Somebody's suffering from this type of must, suffer, somebody's suffering from sihr. You don't make this an entertainment to get views and thousands of subscribers and millions of views and this and that. And then people are saying, Raqi Fulan, Raqi Fulan. This is not a profession. This was never a profession to be a Raqi, right? To be someone who does ruqya as a profession. This, was, this is unheard of in the history of Islam until modern day times. Sure, shuyukh, tullabul ilm, ulama, do they know how to do ruqya? Can they teach you? Yes, that's different. We've had many, right? The Prophet ﷺ, even the hadith in Sahih Muslim, if you can help your brother with the ruqya, then do so. So we have permission from the Prophet ﷺ, but it wasn't anything... Like, oh, he's the sheikh of ruqya. This was not a profession until <laughs> in our times, this video generation that we live in. So that's uh, many times these people, and I've seen such videos myself, uh, like the jinni speaking, speaking, yeah, 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 by your honor, I'm leaving. Okay, I'll, out of the fear of you, I'm leaving. And the ruqya is like, see how an expert, and the people advertise because people work for him. You see, sheikh fulan, the jinn is afraid of him and left within an hour. Only $200 an hour, that's how much you will have to pay for his service. <laughs> but this is shirk. You don't leave by, because of the honor of any human being. You have to leave by, for the fear of Allah, by the honor of Allah. Right? So Ibn Taymiyyah, of course, that's why I said that he has written extensively in how to do this properly from the sunnah, what things to be aware of, because these shayateen can trick you. Right? All of a sudden, oh yeah, yeah, this jinn is leaving, oh yeah, but... He just said a statement of shirk and you agreed to it. So you have fallen into shirk without even realizing it. And you're laughing about and think you did a great job, right? So this is something, a field that many people, unfortunately, they make mistakes in. They fall into shirk, they fall into bid'ah, but we have to be careful about it. Lastly, before we end, brothers and sisters, um, there are many, many other ahadith. Like, for example, once the Prophet ﷺ was in a uh, journey, it's collected in the Mustad of Ahmed, a woman came with her baby, that he cries so much, our whole village, nobody sleeps. So the Prophet ﷺ, uh, you know, hit the baby in the back slightly, and he said, Ya Shaitan, O Shaitan, fear Allah and leave. He knew from the crying that this abnormal crying that this baby does all night long and doesn't let the whole village sleep, this was a shaitan that had possessed the baby and was screaming. So there's many a hadith from the Prophet ﷺ that talk about these type of incidents. But the issue is with Umm Zafar that she was suffering from this disease, this issue. She wa- I'll live with it. Make my adhkar, be patient, keep doing it because that is Jannah. And we end with the hadith. Our mother Aisha radiallahu anha said, this is also a, a agreed upon hadith in Bukhari and Muslim. That ma min musibatin tusibul muslima illa kafar Allahu biha 
anhu. There is no musibah that befalls a Muslim except that Allah will relieve, wipe away some sin because of that musibah, hatta shawkati yushakuha, even if it is a thorn that pricks him. Even something small like that is considered a musibah, something that has caused you hurt. So it is a means for your sins to be forgiven. This is why in Islam, and this is the last thing I'll mention uh, to sum up and uh, go to the questions. If you have any type of illness, any illness, doesn't matter what it is, you ask Allah to cure you, you have every right to go seek the medical treatment. That's your right. You have the option, no problem. However, if you say, I will bear with this illness patiently, I depend on Allah, I'll make dua to Allah, I'll bear with this patiently. Insha'Allah, that is a way to go to Jannah. There have been many scholars throughout history that chose, like for example, Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen, rahimahullah, when he came to Boston before he died from cancer. He came, he saw what chemotherapy, because the Saudi government paid for him, right? He came, came to Boston, uh, he, has, he had cancer. And he looked at what's happening to the people who suffer after chemotherapy. They're more dead, like, and he said, this is what's going to happen to me? And the doctors were like, yes, thank you very much. I'll go back and teach till the day I die. I can't, I can't be bedridden in this way and miss ibadah and miss teaching people. So Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen went back without seeking treatment. You need sabr and you need iman to be those type of people. But any illness out there, if you want to be patient, you can be patient, depend on Allah, but of course it varies from person to person. Nobody's saying that you uh, form a grudge against Allah when the treatment is there. If treatment is available, go ahead and do it. If you want to bear with it patiently, this is your right, no problem, you will have a tremendous reward. So remember that inshallah ta'ala, and again we ask Allah to cure all the Muslims and to protect us from illnesses. So let's uh, quickly take a couple of questions, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, <clears throat> can someone tell an evil person who lived, died in an evil way if he or she would be in hellfire? Uh, no, when someone, if you know that someone was evil, clearly used to do evil acts and the person died, right? Uh, we, re, and the person was Muslim. If the person was Muslim, we remain quiet. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, for the mayyit, for the one who has passed away, your brother or sister, the dead Muslim, if you do not have anything good to say about the dead Muslim, keep quiet. Keep quiet, that's it. So don't give him reward. You're going to be backbiting somebody who has died. It's the truth. Maybe he was a drunk, rapist, drug dealer, who knows what he was. But the guy died. It's not my business or your business to talk about him anymore. The Prophet ﷺ said, Keep quiet. If you don't have anything good to say about your dead brother or sister, then just keep quiet. This will save you from earning any type of sins unjustly. I'll take one more question, inshallah. <clears throat> Let me try to find it first. Got to refresh the page. <clears throat> all right, so that was the only question tonight. No problem, inshallah. So I'll see you all again uh, Wednesday night, inshallah. Subhanak wa alhamdik, ashadu wa la ilaha ila anta, astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik, wa assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.